That is our hope this morning is that you are able to sing. I am a child of God. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9. Last week we began a series entitled Paul. Uh, we, have, we are journeying with one of the most, if not the most, single, most essential conversion in New Testament history. Last week we were reminded <clears throat> that his intention in coming to Damascus was to capture those of the way. Those of the way. And he was going to capture them in order to imprison them only to be taken captive by the one whom he had come to persecute. Jesus himself appears to Saul, blinding him, and then tells him to get up, go into the city, and wait for what he must do. So Paul, or Saul at this time, Saul blinded, is taken by those who were with him, and three days pass, and he is without water and without food. And as Saul sits in the waiting room of the great physician, it is silent. And as, as he sits in the waiting room, God is simultaneously preparing the message so that someone would come and give the message to him. For some of you in this place, you are sitting in the waiting room. You know God's doing something with you. You know He's engaged with you. But you don't really know what He's doing in the midst of all that He is doing. For others of you, you are waiting for God to reveal to you what He is saying to you in the waiting room. And what you need to make sure of is that as you wait in the waiting room, that you are paying dearly attention to the message that is being given. Right? We all need to pay attention to the message. Because you don't know if somebody at this moment in this time has come to give the message. So in God's providence, here He is. He is working in the lives of those whom He redeems. And it is here in this story that we not only see a life transformed, but we see God using His people for His glory as God is going to do two simultaneous things. One, He is going to call someone to adoption as His son. And number two, He is going to use the very one whom He has called to adoption as His son in the process of calling the other to adoption. And this is the beautiful reality of the gospel. God's providence at work in the lives of those whom He is redeeming and in the lives of those whom He redeems. And it is here in this story that we not only see a life transformed, but we see God using His people for His glory. So let us turn in the book of Acts to chapter 9, beginning in verse 10, as we read from verse 10 through verse 19, as we see a life transformed once again. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 19. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles 
and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. Praise be to God for his word. Let us pray. Jesus, we come to you in these times, in these moments, opening your word, listening to stories of situations, of historical records and real life literal situations that happened nearly 2,000 years ago. And some of us may sit in this place wondering and pondering, what does this have to do with me? I, I, I don't know Saul. I don't have anything to do with Damascus. But Jesus, if this is your story, if this is the way that you redeem people, if you, if you truly do save like this, then it has to do with each one of us in this place. And God, for that, we ask that we would come and we would hear from you by the power of your spirit. That God, you would draw us to yourself. And that, Holy Spirit, you would move in a way in which those of us who are your people would be drawn to spread the word of the gospel message that we have known. And Father, for those who do not know you, we pray that they would listen. And they would come to know you before it is eternally too late. For it's in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray these things. Amen. So here we find Saul. But we begin, not with Saul, but we begin by being introduced to this man by the name of Ananias. So the first thing I want us to look at is the call. The call, this man Ananias, his name means one whom Jehovah has graciously given. One whom Jehovah has graciously given. We learn here that he is a disciple. Starts from the very beginning. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. This ought to make the reader, if you were an original reader, if you were a reader who was reading this for the first time, you ought to be asking the question, a disciple of who? Which is a... Very good and important question. In verse 17, we learn that he is none other than a disciple of the one whom he calls Lord, which is Jesus the Christ. We also learn something else uh, later from Paul's testimony when he begins to share this, uh, uh, this illustration, this conversion, if you will, with those uh, in chapter 22 when he is talking to the Jews and he's giving his testimony, uh, he says that Ananias was, quote, a devout man by the standard of the law and well spoken of by the Jews. A devout man by the standard of the law and well spoken of by the Jews. So what does this mean about this man? So we know that he is a disciple, one who worships Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, is obeying Jesus and teaching others to do the same, right? That is the definition that we use. But we also know that he not only is that, but he is also a devout man. A devout man means he is committed to obedience to scriptures. He is is committed to that which the law has called him to be and to do and to live that out in his everyday stuff of life. And he is well spoken of, which means that he is a man who is living out his devotion. He is, he is a faithful man that other people around him, a man whom even the Jews look at and go, hey, he is, he is faithful to what God is calling him to. And here, as you have already heard in our faith family, we say a disciple is one who worships Jesus, is changed by Jesus, obeys Jesus, and teaches others to do the same. A declaration that is a demonstration and a demonstration that is keeping with their declaration. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, it is a man who not only says this is what he believes, but lives what he believes. 
a, as James would come in and say, a faith that works. For faith without works is dead. Ananias is one whose devotion to Jesus is being fundamentally displayed in the way in which he lives. And see, we, we look through these and we skip through this reality, but you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, these are the very people Saul came to persecute. That Ananias is the very person that would be a part of this way. And I shared a little bit about this last week, but he was the very part of the way. And the reason they were called the way is because they had a way about them. How else would they be found? How else are they going to be found? How else is Saul going to come and find the people of the way? Well, the, one of the ways they were going to come find him is by the way they were living. The way they would worship, the way they would speak, the way they would love, the way they would take care of the poor, the way they would take care of those around them, the way they would uh, uh, engage people with truth, all of these things. Ladies and gentlemen, either your discipleship will destroy your secrecy or your secrecy will destroy your discipleship. And here Saul is coming to make this man a convict. And this man ends up being his counselor. He is a man well spoken of by the Jews, the Bible says. His reputation preceded him. And you do know that your reputation precedes you, right? Your reputation goes before you. Men, can I speak to my men real quick? Are you, are you this type of man? Are you a man who believers around you would consider to be a disciple of Jesus? One who is devout, committed, trustworthy, faithful? Are you a man who they would say is well spoken of by others? Your reputation precedes you, my friend. So the one who is called Ananias, we know who it is. Now where is he? He's in Damascus. Damascus is a city 200 miles northeast of Jerusalem. And it, ladies and gentlemen, it is through the providence of God that a man who is a disciple of Jesus would live in this place at this time for this purpose. And while he is living there, the Lord will come to him in a vision. The word vision occurs 12 times in the entire New Testament. 12 times. And only 12 times in the entire New Testament. Once in Matthew, referencing the Mount of Transfiguration. And then, 10 times in the book of Acts. And ladies and gentlemen, every time it's mentioned in the book of Acts, every time there is a vision mentioned in the book of Acts, it is in direct relationship to the mission of God. So when God comes to His people on vision in the book of Acts, the purpose of this is the missio Dei. God forming, making, creating, building, moving His people, and it's all for the purpose of the proclamation of the gospel. This is the reason God comes to His people in amazing visions. It's because the people of God are wanting to live on the purpose of God in the way of God. And we want visions for which car to buy. We, we want visions for which college to go to. We want visions for all kinds of different things. But when you, when you look in the Scriptures, the reason that we find visions coming, it was to be on God's mission. Now, I'm not saying this to you in, 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 in definition, but I'm saying this to you in reality. If the way in which God reveals Himself through visions is by being on His mission, the way we are going to receive vision is by being on His mission. Mission. It's crazy, isn't it? It's 
So what does Jesus say? Because the method, although the vision is something we looked at, the method method is really uh, secondary to what we look at what he is saying, which is the message. The method is through the vision, but the message is what does Jesus say? What is the very first word that Jesus says? Ananias. Now, this is something we just read and skip over. But what did he call him? Called him by his name. Yes. Yes. Jesus, Jesus would say in his humiliation, as he, in his incarnation, Jesus would say, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus knows the names of those whom he calls his own and his own hear his voice. Dearly beloved, I want to tell you something that is so crucial to this reality. As you live in the mundane, everyday, normal stuff of life, as you live out your Mondays, students, as you live out your middle school and your high school days studying uh, chemistry and and calculus, you know, calculus. I don't even know why we studied calculus because I'm 43 and I haven't used it since I studied it. But we apparently, apparently all college people have to know calculus. So we teach them calculus. I want to let you know in the midst of your calculus that Jesus knows you by name. Moms. Moms and dads cleaning diapers and washing dishes and vacuuming houses and taking care of the loved ones and uh, being a, a taxi for a group of kids, I want you to know that he knows your name. Pastor, as you sit in an office, writing message after message, endless. I was just telling Shay this yesterday. It was amazing. I looked at her and I said, you know the two things I hated, hated to do in high school? Read and write. The only book I read from kindergarten through graduating 12th grade. This is not a lie. This is actual God-given truth. Ralph S. Mouse. (laughs) It's the only book I read from beginning to end through the 12th grade. And now I read seven books at a time. That's not including the books of the Bible. And what has God done with me? Now all I do is read and write. (laughs) Sense of humor. And I sit in that office. And sometimes, you know, I'm flesh. I'm 100% man, right? I'm 100% man. And I I sit in that office sometimes. I, I sit back and I just flop my head. I go, what in the world? What am I doing? And I'm just reminded, as I did it this week, and I studied it, and verse 10 just hit me, and he says, Donnie, oh, he knows my name. I'm grateful. And what is his response? Here I am. Here I am, Lord. You know what that means? Here I am. Yes, Lord. Now, that's that. That's right. You remember Peter? When he would look at Jesus, he would go, no, Lord. You do know no, Lord is an oxymoron, right? It's like a squared circle, a married bachelor. You can't call him Lord and tell him no. If he is Lord, your simple response is yes, Lord. And this is what Ananias does here. He says, yes, Lord, dearly beloved, is the heart tuned to the voice of God so that we are able to hear him? Are our hearts tuned to the voice of God so that we are able to hear him? Now, I want to say something, and I want to say it as clearly as I can so that you don't think I'm some, some weirdo out here. I, God has never, and if he does, I welcome it, trust me, I am as a sign seeker as anybody in my life. God, will you just speak to me, like audibly? I just told somebody this week, in order for me to do that, there's going to have to be like, Daddy, and you. I don't know why we make God with such base. You ever thought about that? Why do we make God, Daddy? Why do we make him like, I don't know. But I guess it's better than going, Daddy. (laughs) 
Donnie, yo. I mean, I guess it's better than that. But here's my point. Here's my point. Listen to me. Get back on track, Donnie. Get back on track. God has never audibly spoken to me. I have never audibly heard God's word spoken to me. Like a, like a voice. I've never audibly heard it. But ladies and gentlemen, God has many times clearly spoken to me. I have heard His voice. I have sensed His presence. And I have known His direction in my life. Even as my calling as a pastor, when I was sitting in the gallery seating of East Brent Baptist Church at Easter Sunday year 2000, I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting in the, I was sitting in the pew and I was sitting there and, and uh, the invitation was given because I was at a good Southern Baptist Church where they gave an invitation every Sunday morning. An invitation was given and I was sitting there and I remember the sense came over. It wasn't an audible voice. It wasn't somebody going, Donnie. It was... It was the sense that came over me that said, and, and the, I, the only way I can explain it is, I'm calling you to preach. It was as clear as the day is long. I'm calling you to preach. And many of you have heard this story. Shay, who's been in church her whole life. I was raised pagan, never been in church. I didn't know what a calling meant. I didn't know, what are you talking about? There's some weird things happening here. So I look over at Shay and I go, I think God's calling me to preach. We've been married one year. She looks at me with all the love and tenderness she can and says, no, he ain't. <laughs> that I heard audibly. And I look back at her and I said, okay, dear. And I sit there. And then Brother Dale does something that in 17 years of knowing him, I've never known him to do. He stops the service. Stops the invitation. And he says, God has impressed upon my heart that somebody in here is being called into the ministry. And you need to come make it public. I look at Shay. I am so sorry. <laughs> and I get up and I make it public. So I say this to you. If you've never heard, audibly heard God's voice, I'm in your company. If you have heard God's voice audibly, fantastic. But I've never heard it. I'm just going off of my experience, ladies and gentlemen. But I have clearly heard His voice. When we gather as a faith family, I ask, is our desire, is the desire of our hearts, is the desires of our soul, have we created the habits when we gather together on Sunday mornings or in our missional communities that we want to hear from God? Or did you wake up this morning and come on Sunday because that's just your normal routine, it's just what you do? You didn't come here to hear from God. You came here probably to complain. You came here because you have a group of people that you really like to be around. I love that. I like the fact that you came here based upon routine. I'm not going to tell you to stop coming. Sometimes we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Hey, look, if you're here because that's just what you do and you didn't come here to hear from God, this is the best place for you to hear from God. So just keep coming by routine. We're okay with that. If, if you just came here just to complain, it's okay. Come on. We got plenty of those. They, we, we got plenty. You can come. You're, you're, you'll find a home somewhere. I guarantee you, okay? Complainers always seem to find grumbling homes somewhere. If you've come just to, just to kind of be with a group of people because you kind of like that, that's fine. That's fine. Come, come. But I want to tell you. Can I tell you this? There is something better. There is something more marvelous. There is something more beautiful. When you come to hear from the Word of God that God would speak through this mere mortal to you and your soul, I'm going to tell you it will change why you wake up on Sunday morning. It changes. Would we give such hearts and such ears 
so that if he were to speak to us, we would hear with what? We would hear with pre- prevenient obedience. Did you hear what I just said? We would hear with prevenient obedience, which means he is Lord, he says do, we say yes. I was speaking to a group of students this past week and I I said, I apologize if I offend you. But if Jesus offends you, I offer no apology. Because if He is Lord of all, and I believe He is, if He is King of kings and Lord of lords, if He offends you, you need to be offended. I know I do. Ladies and gentlemen, is your posture, listen to me, is the posture of your heart prevenient obedience? Have you already made the decision that I'm going to obey God no matter what He says? Ananias says, here I am, Lord. Lord, the one in whom all power and authority and supremacy resides. Here I am. The refrain of the prophet Isaiah when asked, whom shall I send and who will go for us was what? Here am I. Send me. Isaiah, the one in whom stood before the throne of God, seeing God, seeing the heavens, heavens open up to him. He saw this amazing what? Vision. He saw this vision of God. And because he saw God, because the, he, he noticed, and after he saw God, he noticed that he was a sinner, living in the midst of sinners. He, the angel came to him, touched his lips, and because now he touched his lips, now what does his lips say after being touched by, by the, by the, by the uh, thing from the altar? What does he say? Here am I. Send me. Yes, Lord. Do it. Whatever I need to do. You're my Lord. You're my Savior. You're my King. I'm going to do it. It is quite different for one to hear him and then another to be obedient before ever knowing what it is he will ask of you. How often have I done this? How often have I said, God, I'm going to obey you if. And then we we give God our criteria for obedience. We say, God, I'm going to obey you if, of course, it has to fit in my 9 to 5, right? Because, you know, or after, actually, God, I'm going to obey you as long as I can work and get my job done, and then after 5, I, I got you. I got, I'm, going to, I'm, going to eat lunch, I'm going to eat lunch with people, and, and God, I'm going to obey you only if. Only if they, uh, I'm going to obey you if they happen to walk by me. I'm going to obey you if my neighbor asks me to ask him a question. I will obey you by answering. It's craziness. I've done it. I'm crazy. I'm a little loopy. You know, I go, I go, okay, God, I'll talk to my neighbor. If he's standing out in the front yard wearing jeans and flip-flops at 2 o'clock, I got you. So it's 2 o'clock. He's out there. He's wearing flip-flops with shoes, and I know no-go. Uh, wearing, wearing jeans with shoes, sorry. Wearing jeans, flip-flops and shoes. Wearing jeans with shoes, it's a no-go. He didn't, have the, he didn't have the flip-flops on. He should have had the flip-flops on. Have y'all ever done that? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm all by myself. I see some shaking heads. God, I will obey you only if, well, if that's the way it works for you, I got something for you. You are your own God. Because when you tell God, to obey you, and then you will obey him, you have therefore put yourself in his place. Ananias had an ear to hear and a will to obey, even before the details. May the posture of our hearts be, yes, Lord. So there's the call. Now let's turn to the commission, verses 11 and 12. Get up. That's a good first start right there. Get up. Just so there's no doubt, it's a call to action. Very likely that Ananias is in a posture of prayer. So he tells him to what? Get up. So he gets up, and then he tells him to what? Go. Seems like a reasonable first instruction. Get up. Go. Is it reasonable? Yes. Easy? No. No, 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 no. 
How many times have we been told to get up and go and sit down and stay? Get up and go. I'm going to sit down and stay. This is definitely a change in place. Get up and go. Where? Where? And then he gives our God's positioning system, the original GPS. Y'all hear me? OG GPS, right? Original God GPS, original God's positioning system. Here it is. It is what? Get up, go to the street called Straight. Ah, I know where that street is. Got it. Everyone would know where that is. By the way, it's still there. The street called Straight is still there. Stretching three miles from east to west in Damascus. And on this street, there's going to be a house. Got it. I'm going to a house on a street. What's on this street in this house? A man called Judas. Got it. Got the owner. I got the address. I got the owner. Very specific. I want you to inquire for a man named Saul. And what is this Saul going to be doing? He's going to be doing. He's going to be praying. He's seen this vision. He's see actually, he's seen the vision of you coming to him and praying with him. Do you think Ananias understands the vision? Do you think, uh, do you think Ananias understands Paul seeing a vision, Saul seeing a vision? Sure. Why? He's seeing a vision. There's this vision thing happening, right? And, there's this, and he's going, oh, he's seeing, he's seeing something like what I'm Yeah, yeah, he's seeing something what you're seeing. Now watch. Saul has a vision that a man named Ananias is coming and laying hands on him so that he may receive sight. Why would he receive sight? Well, because he's blind. And he's more blind than just merely blind. You see, he's physically blind, yes, but as we will see, spiritual sight as well. How did I know? How do I get this? Donnie, you're just, you're just adding stuff. No, 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 no. When Ananias repeats this, he actually says, watch what he says in verse 17. He says, the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight physically and be filled with the Holy Spirit spiritually. This man is blinded physically and he's blinded spiritually. Have we ever read where God will restore the sight of the blind? Have we ever read the reason God restores the sight of the physically blind is so that the spiritually blind will see that that's what he does? Don't we know that miracles were meant for a message and a purpose? Now we're starting to get this idea, why did God blind Saul? Was so that he would physically experience what he spiritually needed. And this is what we find. So the place is given, the person is given, the plan is given. We got the commission. We know where we're going. Next, we see the conviction, verses 13 and 16. I love it. I love this. I love this. Lord, um, I, I've heard some report, report, reports about this man. How... He harmed, he did evil, he did wicked, the Bible says, to your saints in Jerusalem. He's been given authority to arrest all who come into your name and, 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 and here in Damascus. <laughs> Do you not see the humor? Ananias is telling God who Saul is. <laughs> we do it all the time. I'll never forget being in a prayer meeting one time and had this lady sitting there praying. She wasn't praying to God. She was gossiping all that she knew. God knew all that. God, I just hope you're with Frankie. You know, he has this heart condition, the tube. He needs his tube replaced. You know, his wife isn't nice. What are you doing? Why? Are you? God knows these things. <laughs> Crazy. It's crazy how we do this. The irony that we would inform God. But the Lord is so gracious. And instead of saying, tell me something I don't know, what does God do? He renews His call. So He tries to get out of it. He tries to provide some sort of reality to uh, God. Do you know who you're calling me to? And the Lord said to him, what? Go. He repeats it. Go. Go. We've heard that before, right? Get up and go. What does he say? Go. Why? 
Listen, ladies and gentlemen, this is where salvific reality of all that it means becomes so real. He says, because this man, Saul, is a chosen instrument. To bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that before the creation of this world, you were chosen by the providence of God? And that you are His instrument to be used on His mission for His glory. Notice what it doesn't say. And what it doesn't say is what we try to do today. What it doesn't say is exactly our salvation message. Go, for he, Saul, is a chosen instrument of mine so that he can go and live and have a great life and live his whole life and have three Two and a half children and a retirement plan and uh, 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 live in America and have his, have his three-bedroom, two-bath house. None of that's in there. None of it's in there. None of that is the call of Saul. None of it's telling Saul that. Listen, he says that Saul is his chosen instrument so that he will bear his name before the Gentiles and before the sons of Israel. This very man, Saul, will later write to a young man by the name of Timothy, and he will say this, Listen to me, God doesn't give us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. So if you ever want to know where your spirit of timidity comes from, know it does not come from God. Many of us are waiting on our fears to be removed before we are obedient. And you know what God says? Be obedient, and I will come, overcome your greatest fear. I was just telling a group of young men when I wrote this sermon a couple, about nine weeks ago that courage can only be displayed in the face of fear. Courage requires fear. Courage isn't needed without fear being experienced. We also see the reality here that God calls Paul. And what does he say? I will show him how much he must what? Suffer for my sake. God calls Paul and it is through the lens of Paul's suffering that God is going to be glorified. And that's exactly what Paul will write later. I want to read a few of them to you so you can hear from Paul's words. These are Paul's words. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you, share our, as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also are you sharing shares of our comfort. I could go on, but I'm not. It, it is the call of the church to suffer for the sake of Christ. And it is through this, through this suffering for the sake of Christ that we discover our purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, i got to tell you, in our culture, in American Western Christian culture, this is not a great marketing campaign. Hey, i got this great idea. Suffer for God. Come on, you're going to love it. No, really. It's a lot of joy, a lot of love, and a lot of good. Come suffer. Anybody up for that? I wonder how many people are walking around Excambia County today where if you were to knock on their door and ask them, what, how do they get to heaven, they would say, it's because I have believed in Jesus and ask them how much they suffer for Him. 
How much have you suffered for Jesus? Really? Really? No, really. No. No, really. And if you're in here and you're lost, don't miss it. I am telling you that the gospel message is a message calling you to suffer for the sake of Christ. But it's in the midst of the suffering that you will find your greatest joy and comfort. You see, this is where Jesus comes in and He flips everything upside down when He says, the greatest shall be the least and the least shall be the greatest. For if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. For he who loses his life will find it. How much do you really suffer? Again, I will tell you this, that the greatest threat to the American church and to us sitting in this place at Pine Summit Baptist, as much as I have preached this, our greatest threat is our seduction to comfort and convenience and away from sacrifice and suffering. Mark my words. Missional community leaders, mark my words. Call your people to suffer and sacrifice. And watch what happens. Our greatest threat is our seduction to comfort and convenience. Be very careful, dearly beloved. Suffering for Christ's sake is a greater indication of obedience biblically than comfort and complacency ever will be. Suffering for Christ's sake is a greater indication of obedience biblically than comfort and complacency ever will be. Now, am I telling you to go out there and find a guy with a gun and say, hey, shoot me. I want to suffer for Jesus. No. Am I telling you that when God calls you to, hit, to be obedient to His mission and it requires suffering for you to jump in? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have the call, we have the commission, the conviction. And lastly, we come to the conversion. The conversion, verses 17 and 18. Ananias departs. He goes as an instrument in the hands of a redeemer, enters the house of Judas, and after laying hands on Saul, Ananias says, what? Brother Saul, the dual tender mercy of Christ to redeem a man like Saul and penetrate the heart of a man like Ananias so that the one who came to bound Ananias is now called brother. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the church is not like a family. The church is a family. Don't pass by this without, with some sort of sentimentality devoid of reality. This is similar to God telling you tomorrow, get up and go to Syria. Because the leader of ISIS is waiting on you. Ladies and gentlemen, we got difficulty calling the person that sits in the seat next to us on Sunday, brother, much less a persecutor of the church. Right? Many would have entered the room of Ananias and said, I don't want to, uh, of Saul and said, I don't want to be here. Others would doubt his salvation and demand proof. And Ananias continues and said, The Lord Jesus, this identifies for us, as we stated earlier, that the one who poured out his blood so sinners can be set free, the one who appeared to Saul on the road, is the one who now sends Ananias. The word sent here is what? Apostolo. Apostolo, which is in Greek where we get our word apostle. Now when the translators came and translated the Greek into Latin, they use the word that we translate the word for missionary. So the idea of being on mission, the missionary, the missionary of God to be sent, to be a sent one. And here we have the two purposes. So that Saul would regain his sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. What a picture of God's church. That we would care for people's physical life and their spiritual life. 
that we would come in and help provide healing and salve for their brokenness, but also we would provide a message of gospel for their soul. What, the, what a gracious hand of God. What a picture it is. God using this devout disciple, this devoted disciple, as a means by which He provides salvation. Did you ever think of this? God could have very well saved Saul on the Damascus road without Ananias at all, couldn't He? He could have said, Saul, be saved, and he would have been saved over. End of story. Saul would have had the same story. Why? Why does God use men like Ananias Ooh, I don't know. Why does he use men like Ananias? Why does he use me? Uh, it's because he reaches down in the small towns, calls one of his own to be the means by which the Holy Spirit would come and fill Saul. You see, the means by which God uses to proclaim His message is always His people. Do, do you see it? You. My Ananiases. God has redeemed you for the purpose of being a redeeming people. And that may very well lead, may lead to suffering. But if so, you look at it and you go, but I have been redeemed for this very purpose. And you receive it with joy. You rejoice in your suffering. Now you're getting it. Oh, this is why. How quick we often seem to be condemned the very ones God has called us to go to proclaim the message to. One pastor asked it like this and it touched my heart. He said, who are the 20th century lepers that we would go and touch them as Jesus calls us to? Who are the people that people don't want to touch? Ananias, a man only given just a few verses in Scripture. As quick as he appears, Ananias is gone. He will never appear in Scripture again. Stick with me. He will never appear in Scripture again. Eight measly verses dedicated to Ananias. But this is the man God used for His purposes. What happened to Ananias? We don't know. But here we witness a disciple doing what a disciple should do. Living a life of devotion and demonstration. Listening and obeying the voice of God so that others may come to know Him. He wrote no book. He wasn't on any preaching circuits. He never gets mentioned again. There's no fanfare. There's no picture in a brochure telling us of his next message series. We have created a culture whereby it seems to indicate that God only pledges himself to big names and big shows and big churches. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth of the matter is this. God will use big names and big churches and big shows but I am here to tell most of us, many of us, if not all of us, that God also uses men like Ananias who are merely conduits for His grace and mercy. Small names, small churches, and small shows for His glory. Men who are intentional in doing what disciples are called to do, which is what? Worship Jesus. Be changed by Jesus. Obey Jesus. And teach others to do the same. A God who uses people like you and me. Normal, everyday, saltine cracker people. The saltine is normal. There was a poem that was written and it reads like this. We are writing a gospel a chapter each day by the deeds that we do and the words that we say. 
Men read what we write, whether faithless or true. So, what is the gospel according to you? You know, here's the truth. The people you run into day after day, they, many of them have never read the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But you know what they are reading? They're reading the gospel of Donnie. See, on the one hand, we have those who think they can't be used. And the only other, other hand, we have those who think they can't be saved. And in this one story, we see an amen to both. I point you to Saul, a man who was a persecutor of the church. And possibly, possibly guilty of murder, definitely an accomplice to murder. And the death of Stephen, at the very least, who one day met Jesus and whose life is forever changed. This is a man who was a persecutor of the church. He was an enemy of the way. He was going around ruthlessly attacking and threatening and being a terrorist to the church. And you sit in here in this place, you listen to my voice, and you wonder if God will save you. I will say this without we equivocate without, without question. Yes. God saves lost people. For I have come to save the lost. It is, it, is the, it is the sick who need a doctor. But you have to see your need in the doctor. I say, would you like your life to be changed? Would you like to experience salvation for your soul, rescue from your sin, redemption and restoration for your being? Would you like to find purpose? Purpose that very well may result in suffering, but a suffering for the glory of God that will one day, in the end of days, in the end of times, will be lifted up, and in that day when there is no more tears, no more, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sin, you will see your suffering in the light in the midst of the story, and you will see that God used you a normal, everyday Ananias for His glory, and He gets the praise and the glory and the honor for it. Oh my gosh. Then listen to the gospel message, and if by God's grace the scales of your eyes fall off, you too could get up and be baptized. Did you notice how it concludes? Concluded? It says, now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. Even the great Apostle Paul needed community. Imagine the atmosphere. Can you imagine the atmosphere in that room? The one who came to persecute and arrest them now sits there being one of them. Uh... I wonder, if they, I wonder if Ananias is in the room and they look at him. I wonder if they say, I have to go use the bathroom. <laughs> Ananias, don't you have to go use the bathroom too? The one who came to persecute has now joined you. That demands a lot from a, a peculiar people. Unless, of course, they remember. Unless, of course, they remember that they too were once enemies of God and saved by grace through faith. You see, ladies and gentlemen, for people who are captivated by God's grace always sees the hope of salvation in others because it is through that hope of salvation in others that they are reminded of their own. So how does this message change the way you think? For some of you, it ought to change the way you think because you think you're unreachable by God's hand. And I want you to tell you there is no person that is so, so sinful that God can't redeem and restore. For others of you, you think you're too small. You think your life is too normal, too ordinary, and God doesn't use people like that. I want to tell you, God uses people like that, and it's littered throughout the Gospels. It's littered throughout the Old Testament, and it's littered in this church, in this community. He uses normal, everyday, 
people for his glory. Ordinary people for his extraordinary purposes. That ought to be a sermon series. Maybe it changes the way you think and seeing your life as being ready to get up and go. What does it change about your, what, the, way you, the way your heart? What is it changing in your heart? Maybe, what we, uh, maybe it changes in your heart the way you experience um, the salvation of others. Maybe, maybe in your heart you're going, I live in fear. I live in fear. God, I want you to, I want you to give me all. The, I want you to give me the street and the straight and the this and the that. But listen, listen to me. If he were to give you the street and the house and the address and the owner's name of the house on which to go and then tell you it's Saul, for some of us, it's our heart saying, I live in fear. God help me not live in fear, but live in your glory. Live in your goodness. Live in your grace and your greatness. Let me live in your presence so that no matter what you call me to, I will have the courage. The courage. That means in the very presence of fear, I will be able to obey and know that it is through the obedience that I will experience your presence. This is why here in our faith family, one of the ways in which we structure discipleship is through gather, go, grow. Gather, go, grow. We did that on purpose. It's not gather, grow, go. Because we believe it's through the going that you grow. You don't grow and then go. No, 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 no. You grow through the going. So go. Prevenient obedience. Maybe for some of you, it's doing that. Maybe so our head changes the way we think. Our heart changes the way we feel, the way we experience. Maybe for some of you, it's loving your brother next to you as though he were your brother. It's loving your sister next to you as though they were your sister. It's understanding that the person next to you is redeemed by the self-same grace that you want to be redeemed by. So we look with people with love and grace and mercy. We repent and we believe in Jesus is better. How does it change the way you behave? Head, heart, hands. How does it change what you do? It very well could mean in this very place that God is calling you to get up and you go. It could be your next door neighbor. It could be your best friend. It could be your mom, your dad, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousin. It could be somebody at work. It could be, uh, it could be the person sitting right next to you. It could be somebody in this room who you've offended, who you know God is telling you to get up, go, and reconcile with your brother. Because before you partake in the Lord's Supper, you need to make sure you do that. It could be God calling you to get up and go and do what He has called you to do in order to make a decision for your life, trusting that even in the wrong decision, He is sovereign and providential in it. Do you hear me? Young people, do you hear me? It's even discovering God's will through being obedient to what He has given you and knowing that He is providential even in the wrong and the right. That's good, that's good. How many, how many senior adults in this place could say, I've made many wrong decisions and God was providential in it? Amen? God has seen me through it. God has used it to make me the person I am today. Oh, dear God, help us. So wherever he's calling you in hand, in head, hearts, and hands, I say that we would be obedient. Will you please stand to your feet? So we come to this place, and for some of you who are outside of the kingdom of God, you know that you have not trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know that you have not believed in him by faith, by grace through faith. And you know that He is not your Father. You have not been adopted. You are not justified. To you, I say, all three come together simultaneously. In your head, you know that He is Christ and Lord. In your heart, you trust that He is risen from the dead. And with your hand, you come forward and you make it public saying, I want to be baptized and I want to follow and I will forever obey Him. But I want to tell you, as a testimony, as my testimony, I don't give, I don't give uh, self-help quotes. I don't do that. Here's what I'm telling you. He is calling you to a life of obedience. And sometimes that obedience is not quite what you want. I, I've said this before in our church, and our church knows what I mean. God has ruined my life. Praise be to God. Because the life I had planned is ruined. Praise God, He ruined it. 
And for those of us who are his children, we know we have been adopted. We know we have a hope of glory. We know he is changing us from the power of sin in our life. We come to this place. We come to this time as we share in these elements of the body and the blood and we're reminded of what Christ has done for us in his body and his blood. We're reminded that he lived the life that we couldn't live. He died the death that we deserve to die and that he has redeemed us. And we are to be obedient that our prevenient response would be what? Yes, Lord. And with whatever you're thinking in your head, your heart or your hands, wherever you ascend in your thoughts, your your emotions or your deeds, now we would come and we would repent. We'd be reminded that he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins if we were to confess our sins and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we, we pray. So there's two responses. Either number one, you believe by faith. Actually, there's three. You, be, you don't believe and you remain in your sin, lost. Number two, you come to faith. You believe in him and you follow through in baptism. Or number three, those who believe we repent and we follow him by participating in the Lord's Supper. For those of you who have been baptized, we'll participate in the Supper. We ask for those of you who haven't, you may come, you may watch, you may experience it, you may see it and taste it, or see it actually, but we ask that you not participate because this is what? The Lord's Supper. So if you don't call him Lord, you don't participate in his supper. And this is meant to push you to something, to push you to this. There will come a day when he draws all of his people around his table, his family. And if you are separated from this supper, there will come a day in which you will be separated from that one. But to be separated from this one, there is still hope. Repent and believe. To be separated from that one, is eternal separation. So let us pray. Go before God with our with our faith and in faith and trusting in him. So faith family right where you are, let us pray and repent and come to trust in him once again. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he said, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Faith family, let us participate in the Lord's Supper this morning within our missional community. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.